Hey, 42 here. A few weeks ago, I did a little experiment. Nothing too crazy. I wasn't trying to resurrect Winston Churchill in my garage. It was a food experiment. In a semi-intoxicated haze, I opened my fridge and started sporadically slinging everything in sight into a frying pan. There was bacon, a bit of cheese, a few mushrooms, some slightly old cherry tomatoes, a hearty dollop of jarred kimchi, and finally, a splash of Worcestershire sauce. I wasn't expecting much. It was 2am and 95% of my brain had already gone to sleep. But what emerged from that searing saucepan of assorted shite upon my stove was absolutely glorious. It was a meaty, savoury flavour bomb that seemed to coat my mouth with every single bite. I didn't realise it at the time, but I had inadvertently combined a selection of foods that are rich in a naturally occurring chemical compound. One that makes pretty much anything taste goddamn delicious. It's why pringular popping leads to not stopping. And it's the reason you'd murder your own mother for a packet of Monster Munch. Now, the ancient Greeks believed the Earth is made up of four elements. Earth, water, air, and fire. And then science happened, and we realised that everything that everyone has ever said before the 15th century was absolute and total crap. And now it's happening again. You see, modern science had been under the belief that there were four basic tastes. Sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And everything we eat was made up of some combination of those flavours. But as it turns out, that's also not true. There's actually a fifth taste. That's every bit as important as the others. And yet most of us hadn't heard of it until very recently, particularly in the West. Welcome to the finger-licking world of umami. Surfshark VPN keeps you safe and private by covering up everything you do online. And Surfshark VPN lets you travel the world virtually by changing your virtual location. Or if you are physically traveling, Surfshark lets you connect via your home country so you don't have to miss out on all your home comforts, such as streaming video content from home that might be blocked whilst you're traveling. There are over 3,200 servers in 100 countries, so anywhere you'll go, you'll find a server that fits your needs. Surfshark VPN offers a multi-hop feature so you can put two VPN servers between you and your online destination for even more privacy and security. And I especially love Surfshark's IP Rotator feature, which constantly changes your device's IP address without losing your VPN connection. It's really important to stay safe online when you're out and about. And that's why I use Surfshark VPN, so I can, for example, access my online banking safely, even on public Wi-Fi. There's no chance I'd ever do that without a VPN. VPNs also keep your location and download history private, so you can send and receive files securely. Quite simply, Surfshark VPN is an essential tool, and by using the code 42, you'll benefit from free extra mums for free. All you have to do is click the special link in the description below, so don't miss out. And a big thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video. Our story begins in 1907, when a Japanese chemist called Kakuni Ikeda was sitting down to eat a bowl of dashi, as he did almost every night with his family. But, as he ate, Ikeda noticed that something strange was going on. He stopped eating, took a moment for pause, and declared that it was the greatest soup he'd ever eaten. Something was different. As a matter of fact, that day's soup was prepared with the addition of kombu, an edible kelp eaten widely across Asia. The soup possessed a powerful and Moorish taste. It was a taste he'd been experiencing his entire life, only he hadn't really realised it until this very moment. Intrigued, Ikeda dedicated all his time to investigating why a simple sliver of seaweed made his soup taste so superb. And then, in 1908, he cracked it. Ikeda discovered that the taste he'd experienced in his bowl of dashi was caused, primarily, by a single molecule, an amino acid called glutamic acid, which, once digested, turns into glutamate in the body. The more Ikeda looked into it, the more he realised it was everywhere. But certain foods, seaweed, meat, cheese, tomatoes, soybeans and others, are particularly packed with glutamate. Ikeda had made a genuine scientific discovery. There was a fifth taste, and he named it umami, roughly meaning delicious taste. But for the best part of the next century, 
nobody really took him seriously, especially outside of Asia. It's easy to see why too. The idea of a fifth taste is pretty out there. It would be like trying to convince the world that you found a new hole from which to urinate. But as the 20th century drew to a close, his work began to gain traction in the culinary and science world. In 2003, the word umami was officially added to the Oxford English Dictionary, and today it's widely accepted as the fifth taste, and touted by every chef worth his salt. <coughs> I mean umami. Umami is created for a process called umami synergy, where glutamate and nucleotides combine to create a taste that's greater than the sum of its parts. The result is a mouth-filling, broth-like flavour, when you eat something and it instantly coats your entire mouth with a deep, rich, almost meaty flavour. That's umami. And as for the star of the show, glutamate, you may have heard that word before within the context of monosodium glutamate. If not, then you certainly heard of its acronym, MSG. Being a chemist, Ikeda wanted to isolate which variant of glutamate had the strongest flavour-enhancing effects. He tried calcium glutamate, magnesium, potassium, and others, and then he found it. Monosodium glutamate. This was the compound he'd been searching for. Conveniently, it also happens to be the most soluble and the easiest to crystallize. And so, that's exactly what he did. He crystallized seaweed broth to create a powder. A powder that he could then add to any other food during the cooking process to supercharge its taste and mouthfeel. Basically, Ikeda had created the crack cocaine of the food world. A magic powder for chefs to cheat their way to achieving incredible flavour. So he started a company, Ajinomoto, meaning the essence of taste. The first company in the world to manufacture MSG. It's fair to say that went pretty well. Today, a Jinimoto turns over in excess of 10 billion US dollars per year. Turns out there's a lot of money to be made in ambiguous white powders. Nowadays, MSG is typically made by fermenting starches like rice, corn, or sugarcane. And you'll find a jar of it in almost every kitchen in China, Thailand, Japan, and most of Southeast Asia. But it has penetrated the West too, only it had to do so in a much more subtle way because of, well, to put it bluntly, prejudice. You've probably heard of Chinese restaurant syndrome. It was even described in Merriam-Webster's dictionary as a group of symptoms such as numbness of the neck, arms and back with headache, dizziness and palpitations that is held to affect susceptible persons eating food and especially Chinese food heavily seasoned with monosodium glutamate. The syndrome was first mentioned in a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1968. The claims in the letter were later found to have no basis in science. But, unfortunately, the damage had been done, and the idea of Chinese restaurant syndrome and the supposed link between MSG and negative health consequences rapidly gripped the American psyche. It was an easy claim to swallow, after all. MSG sounds mysterious and processed, and it comes from a faraway land, in a strange place called Asia. Thankfully, we now know better. Despite countless studies, there is absolutely zero evidence to date that consuming moderate quantities of MSG causes headaches, numbness, or any other long-term negative symptoms whatsoever. In fact, no seasoning has ever been the subject of more safety testing than MSG. So next time Karen blames her numb toe on a prawn cracker, you can safely ignore her. A Ajinimoto actually went on the attack against Merriam-Webster for their description, calling it racist and unscientific, and after some time, they adjusted it. So yeah, MSG is everywhere. In fact, you probably have some in your kitchen right this very moment. It's hidden away in all sorts of processed foods, like frozen meals, canned soups, and a crapload of snacks. And there's so much MSG in one bag of Doritos, you could open a Chinese takeaway. It's also a key ingredient in the world's most popular sauces like ketchup, barbecue, and mayonnaise. But like I said, because of decades of unwarranted negative public opinion about MSG, it often goes by sneaky pseudonyms in the ingredients list, such as sodium caseinate, hydrolyzed protein, and autolyzed yeast, which sounds like something you'd find growing on a dead pigeon. And herein lies the problem with MSG. 
Recent studies suggest it's actually a healthier seasoning than salt or sugar. But, and this is a big but, MSG is frequently used by manufacturers to make bland, unhealthy, and non-nutritious foods taste absolutely amazing and so addictive that you just can't stop buying and eating them. And honestly, that's the biggest problem with MSG. It's not the MSG itself, it's the junk food that it makes our bodies crave. But it's not all bad news, umami can be enjoyed naturally too. Mushrooms are umami rich and super healthy, as is seaweed, garlic and anchovies. Pizza is officially the world's favourite food. Five billion pizzas are eaten every year. And I think I have a pretty good idea why. It's because I eat five billion pizzas every year. <laughs> Only joking. It's because wheat, especially sourdough due to the fermentation process, is high in umami. Tomatoes are high in umami. And you guessed it, cheese. Especially Parmigiano Reggiano is very, very high in umami. Pizza, especially Neapolitan, is literally an umami, salt, fat and acid sandwich. Italian cuisine in general is plush with umami, so it's no surprise it's universally adored. Now I'm not saying pizza is a healthy option, but when made from good, natural ingredients, it's a damn sight better than all the heavily processed crap that MSG is usually added to. Kakuna Ikeda may have been the first person to give umami a name, but interestingly, he wasn't the first person to notice it. Not even close. In fact, umami has been known about and exploited in cooking for over 2,000 years. Most famously, in the kitchens of ancient Rome. Though it's fair to say, unlike Ikeda, they had no understanding of the science behind the flavour. The Romans were addicted to a secret sauce that they laced many of their dishes with. It was called garum and it was made by fermenting fish guts and other seafood. It sounds absolutely disgusting. It smells absolutely disgusting. And it probably tasted absolutely disgusting, if eaten on its own. But it formed the backbone of their cuisine, for one simple reason. It was utterly packed with umami. A few drops in a dish transformed its flavour. You might think it sounds similar to modern day fish sauce, but it was actually more akin to Worcestershire sauce. Or Colatoro di Alici, Italian anchovy sauce. Garum was so popular that it was exported all around the Mediterranean, as far north as Britain and as far south as Morocco. But the Romans weren't the only ancients to discover umami. The Chinese and the Japanese were using umami rich soya sauce as early as the 3rd century AD. And the Greeks have been using a fermented fish sauce called Garros, similar to garum, since the 5th century BC. It's actually pretty crazy to think that the existence of umami has been well known since ancient times, and yet, it wasn't until the 20th century that we figured out what it actually is. But then again, it took us until the 19th century to figure out the reason we shit ourselves when we drink dirty water is because there's bacteria in it. So maybe humans are just a bit slow on the uptake. So, we've established that the world is low-key addicted to umami, and we always have been, since the dawn of snacks. But that begs the question, why? What is it about this simple amino acid that makes us want to rip our shirts off and bathe in soya sauce? Well, I'm afraid you might find the answer a little disturbing. Humans are addicted to umami because when we eat it, we are eating ourselves. Okay, to be fair, I'm being a bit dramatic, but allow me to clarify. Umami is principally derived from the taste of glutamate, an amino acid. Glutamate isn't just something that's added to our foods. In fact, it's produced naturally by our bodies. Glutamate plays a pivotal role in our nervous system. Acting as a neurotransmitter that helps send signals between nerve cells, it's actually one of the most abundant neurotransmitters in the brain. Amino acids like glutamate are the building blocks for proteins, which aid in growth, repair tissue and so much more. Thus, our predilection for umami is nature's way of ensuring we indulge in glutamate whenever we can. Our tongues even have specific taste receptors for detecting glutamate, called T1R1 and T1R3. Those are the names of the receptors, by the way, not droids from Star Wars. Moreover, human breast milk is laden with glutamate, 
meaning our affinity for and codependency for umami starts very early in life. Breast milk provides newborns with essential nutrients, and the taste of umami within it might serve as a reinforcement mechanism, encouraging babies to feed. So, glutamate is a part of what it means to be human. It's a part of our psyche, literally. Acting as a neurotransmitter, glutamate is literally the catalyst for thought. So, in a strange way, when we desire umami, it is umami itself telling us to desire it. You could say that umami isn't just one of the five basic tastes, it's the one taste to rule them all. Thanks for watching. Just a quick word to say that I couldn't make these videos without the support of my Patreon members. Consider joining the exclusive 42 Discord community by supporting me on Patreon. It's a great place to discuss my videos with like-minded individuals and myself. The link's in the description, but if you don't want to, or you can't join my Patreon, then please don't worry. A simple like or comment to say thanks would also put a huge smile on my face. Thank you.